Hey, today we're taking a look at another lens from Tamron, and this time it's the 35mm f1.4 uh, D I U S D. There's a bunch of different letters after that. So let's get into it. Hey, what's up? I'm Scott, and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, thank you for watching. We do all kinds of test tutorials, reviews, unboxings, you know, anything photo and video related. So if you do like the content today, please do consider subscribing and make sure to hit the little bell icon to get notifications when new content is uploaded in the future. So I've used and owned 35 millimeter lenses from Nikon, a couple from Canon, uh, one from Sigma. I've also used Tamron's 1.8 version uh, and I've been completely more than satisfied with this 1.4 version from Tamron on all fronts. A quick thank you to Tamron Japan for loaning me this lens for review and Keep in mind that my comments will, as always, be my own. I asked them to review this lens, not the other way around. In case you want the short story, the basic idea of this lens is that, well, prices will vary with sales, rebates, and all of that. This is priced just slightly higher than their 1.8 version, and around the same as the Sigma alternative, but you get nearly edge-to-edge -edge sharpness wide open with beautiful bokeh, no chromatic aberration, and fast, accurate autofocus. Canon's newest 35mm f1.4 L Mark II might very slightly outperform this, and I mean slightly, but it's twice the price. There's some heavy vignette, uh, as expected, with a lot of uh, wide aperture lenses, but you do get really good flare control and a really well-made weather-sealed lens. I honestly want to keep this one for myself. I'm not looking forward to sending it back to Tamron. But of course, for the long story, let's take a closer look. So this is a full-frame lens, but of course you can use it on an APS-C camera for around a 56 millimeter equivalent. Uh, and you can see here it has that rubber gasket at the rear, which indicates that this does have a weather sealing. Uh, and it also does have their fluorine coating on the front element to protect against dust, dirt, and smearing. You also get their B bar G2 coating, which should help with ghosting and flare. And it's not not existent, but this does do very well against flare, which we'll take a look at in just a minute. Of course, it is compatible with Tamron's tap-in console, just as all of their new lenses are, for fine-tune adjustments if you need that and firmware updates. I'm on mirrorless, so accuracy is not really an issue personally, and I don't need that. This lens has a 30 centimeter minimum focus distance, which gives you a 0.2 or 1 to 5 times magnification, which is pretty close to Canon's uh, lens and Sigma's, but it's not quite as close, actually, as the 1.8 lens from Tamron. It goes, of course, from f1.4 up to f16, and it's got 14 elements in 10 groups and all kinds of special ones in there that, of course, if you want to read up on the spec sheet, you can find that on their website. This lens has 72 millimeter front filter threads, uh, which is a little bit larger than the Sigma version. I honestly wish that they were 77 millimeters just so that way it would kind of match most of my lenses, but uh, this is all metal, very, very solid, including those filter threads, which are metal as well. Uh, and it comes in at a pretty heavy 815 grams, which is a little bit heavier than the Canon version, and also a few hundred grams heavier than the Sigma version. But it does feel very, very well made. I mean, all the way from the back to the front, everything about this feels like a premium lens. In terms of the physical design, there's really not a whole lot to it. You've got the single switch on here for autofocus and manual focus, which feels good. It's got a nice confident click. It's just like all of the switches on recent Tamron lenses. And then, of course, you can grab the focus ring at any time, even if it's in autofocus mode, uh, to adjust that if you want to. And you do have that focus distance window, which is definitely useful at times. Um, but there's no hard stops on this. The focus ring, though, does feel nice. It's got a nice amount of resistance and it's smooth um, and it has a decent uh, distance of travel to it. It's somewhere between 90 and 180 degrees. Um, I'll put more specifically up on screen. In terms of what I guess you would call accessories, you've got the typical Tamron G2 lens cap, which flares out a little bit to cover even that little weather seal gasket on the back there, which is very nice. You've got the same lens cap uh, as all of the recent Tamron lenses, which has very deep little pinches here. And honestly, it's one of the best design caps that I've used. And then you've got a very solid lens hood here, which does have that lock so that way it doesn't come off. And the button to release that lock is actually really, really nice. Easy to push and it has a very good, confident click to it. Um, very nice, even for you know something as simple as a little lens hood here. Moving on to the image quality. Uh, it really was very strong overall, so I feel like there's not much to say, but we'll run through some tests to show you a few examples, and I'll try and put uh, some of the original files in a downloadable link below the video if you want to play around with them yourself. 
I process these in Capture One with my typical bass adjustments, but any additional corrections for vignette, chromatic aberration, distortion, and sharpness have been turned off. Uh, and this was all shot on the Canon EOS R, which is a full frame mirrorless camera. As far as sharpness goes, this lens just kills it. In the center, it's really sharp right from f1.4, and that goes all the way out to the edge. Stopping down to f2, 2.8, and so on, the biggest difference that I see isn't in sharpness, but in brightness just as the vignette clears up. I saw zero reason throughout my testing to pixel peep any more than that. Even looking into the far corners, my eyes aren't good enough to tell a significant difference when stopping down. It may be there either in sharpness, contrast, or both, but I would consider it negligible. Tamron did a great job with these optics. I really didn't see any chromatic aberration sticking out, even in challenging situations. Trees against a bright sky, high contrast wires, in focus, out of focus. It's an impressive performance, and uh, there's no reason to stop down in order to get clean images. There seems to be a very slight color shift that comes along with the vignette wide open, which is actually pretty heavy, and it spreads further into the center of the frame, not just the corners. It starts to clear up pretty quickly uh, and is more or less gone by f2.8, with only slight improvement from there on out. There's a slight amount of barrel distortion, but it's nothing overly major or too difficult to correct for. When the sun is in your frame, I did find some ghosting and flare popping up here and there, but I was really, really trying for it. And in most normal shooting, I don't see it being much of a problem at all. I was very impressed with the autofocus here. I don't think anyone will really be shooting sports as the main use of a 35mm prime lens, but even with my son running towards and away from the camera, using face tracking on the EOS R, I got nearly all of the shots in focus. For walking, even at irregular speeds like you might see in uh, events or weddings or more photojournalistic use, it nailed pretty much every shot. Now granted, this is with a mirrorless camera, but I've never had any issues with hunting for focus, speed, and while it may have slightly harder time when strongly backlit, the lens generally found its focus very quickly and very confidently. So at least on the Canon EOS R, I would feel incredibly confident with the focus of this lens in any situation that I would bring it into. Like I said, this lens can get one to five magnifications at 30 centimeters, which is not too bad, but that background simply melts away at that focal length into really smooth and non-distracting out of focus area. Bokeh balls don't have any weird edges, they're clean inside and they remain pretty round up until about f2.8 where you can start to see the shape of the aperture blades start to take form. There's not too intense of a cat eye like effect around the edges either, which some people will be definitely happy to hear. Now close up at this maximum magnification, detail is very sharp and everything looks great. So the Tamron 35mm f1.4 lens is a very well-rounded, solidly built and solid performing package with only minor setbacks in vignette, but for the price, it is an amazing lens to have in your kit and I hope that I can hang on to this one for a little bit longer before sending it back. I don't have it here to compare directly at the moment, but this does perform very, very closely to the most recent Canon L lens, which costs twice as much. And in a lot of areas, this definitely outperforms the Sigma. If you want my recommendation for a 35 millimeter f1.4 lens, this is absolutely the one to get. Uh, you can't go wrong with the Canon version if you have the money for it, but. Anyway, if you have any questions or comments, let me know down below the video and I will do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. And also don't forget to check out the video description for a link to this lens as well as some photos that you can download to play with yourself. If you like this video or found it helpful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, thank you for watching.